I was really lucky with my childhood. I didn't have um, a turbulent childhood um, and, and that was the, the glory days of my life. But what that set me up for was a real wake up call and a shock when I was 19 and my parents divorced. Wow. Uh, and that was a big rift in the family. And so I think with these what we, you know, it's interesting what we label as trauma and how we compare those traumas to other people. I've always thought, oh, but my trauma isn't as bad as someone else. Um, but it, it is all relative. And, and I think, yeah, to someone who was like, oh, life's all great. Everything's fine. Within the reason. Yes. You know, yeah. I suddenly had the, like the, the, the whole world crumble and it, it was, um, I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't have the resilience and I didn't, know how to deal with it for a long time. And so that really shook me up for a number of years. And um, it was, for me, anxiety was like waking up every morning, heart racing, feeling like my life's taken a turn that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't like where my life is now. I don't like life with my family broken. I don't like this new new situation and, and you know, not being able to see dad all the time because he, you know, lived somewhere else and I was still living at home at the time. And, you know, just those kind of, those kind of things, like suddenly, uh, my dad wasn't available to me. He had, mm. he, he moved on to a new relationship, um, and has had since had other children, which is, you know, something I've come to accept now, but at the time, um, yeah, a solid figure in your life of support. Um, I've had to kind of, I suppose adjust like the biggest step moving forward for me was forgiveness. Yep. That took about four years yeah. to get there. I actually found that book. Um, are you familiar with Louise Hay? No, no. Oh, oh, that's she's not a legend. Wow. Okay. She's, she's like the mother of all of the affirmation work. Oh, in, nice one. In sort of. Yeah. Um, and she, I just found her book. It was colorful and nice. And it said, you can heal your life. And at the time, I felt like I needed that. So yeah. I, I found this book and that was my first sort of introduction, I suppose, into the whole um, self-help journey and, and, in, and exploring your inner world. And one of her chapters said, and I now teach this to people too, it, it said, uh, it was talking about the importance of forgiveness. And then it said, who would be the hardest person to forgive? They're the person you have to forgive the most. Oh God, so good. Yeah. So hard though. Yeah, oh, yeah. Just sitting, sitting on this beach, like crying, like yeah. kind of trying, like, <laughs> you know? yeah. Throw the book um, in the water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Had my journal there, was writing it out, and I was forgiving everyone I could think of. And um, yeah, the hardest people to forgive were actually second hardest was my dad, but mm. the, the the real hardest one was um, the his his new wife. Oh yes. Um, yes. Cause she's the other, I didn't have, you know, I, I still love my dad. <laughs> oh yeah. But I could demonize her if I wanted to. Yes. And it makes so much sense. Like at that age, that's so interesting how similar our stories are, you know, like my really? parents divorced when I was 18 and that was my oh. trauma, you know, because you learn about trauma and you're like, well, I didn't go to war. I wasn't sexually abused, but the, the, the blunt force, um, volatility carpet pulled from beneath your feet compared to what your life was, you know, um, is so hard to re-navigate that you, it's exactly right. Exactly what you said. Pain is relative. And how do we pick up the pieces from here? I can't imagine what that would be like because at that age, I just imagine you would see the result of that anxiety and everything that's come undone in your, um, in your family because of that other so easy to demonize. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, and it's an ongoing thing. Like sometimes even now a little thing will come up and I'll feel that egoic urge in me to blame and throw, you know, like judgment at her. Mm. Um, but I just have to, you know, I just remind myself, this is just a human being just trying to be happy in this crazy, crazy world. Mm. And, you know, I think that always helps going back to the, the level of seeing someone as a human who has flaws, who's just trying to make the best choices they can for their life and just trying to be happy. Mm, that's such a, and it's so important, I think as well, you know, um, Ram Dust is someone that I loved and he passed away um, not too long ago. And his analogy was that, you know, for whatever reason, we look at humans differently 
uh, to the way we look at trees. But when we go out into a forest and we look at trees, we don't judge them for being bent or, you know, discolored. We just recognize that that tree perhaps didn't get enough sun when it was young. That's right. And so in, you know, going back to the example of my, my dad's um, second wife, the, you know, who am I to judge what she has gone through with her life, her parents, her life experiences that led her into um, those, those, that situation. Um, And it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. Ego doesn't like it, but, but much more peaceful way of living your life at the end of the day when you hold a grudge you're the one that suffers they're not suffering that's yeah absolutely and And you're only setting yourself free (laughs) yes exactly right despite how good it feels i love hurting myself (laughs) i know so where did the um where did the naturopathy stuff come into this Okay, so I floated around for a bit um, trying to work out what I wanted to do with my life and, and you know, had the anxiety and I was afraid of every turn and, and um, not sure what to do But it, for my career, I suppose. Um, I, I always thought I was going to end up studying law because that's what the family, a few people in my family did and um, friends and things. But I have always been a bit, I don't know, it just didn't resonate with me. I saw... Um, they're that kind of life and I didn't want that and that's all I knew so that was my intuition talking to me pretty yeah. early on and I just remember looking at the like what I would be learning in my naturopathy and nutrition degree and all the subjects just like made me so excited so mm-hmm. I followed that excitement and um, through that time that's where I learned a lot about nutrition um, thought I could save myself with just food and not actually doing the meditation, not actually looking at the forgiveness stuff, you know, um, all of those other components that I think are so important as well. And I got too obsessive with it. And I ended up being really restrictive with food, like not restrictive as in I wasn't eating, but I was restrictive with, I can't eat that. No, no, I don't eat that. Can't go out to that cafe because they don't have anything that I can eat. Um, you know, just starting to get way too overboard with it. I didn't drink alcohol at all. And wow. that, was a, that was a solid rule for me in my early 20s when wow. that's what all my friends were doing. So it was a bit socially isolating, but it was something in my head that, that I don't know, it, it seemed like I was like, well, I don't mind not drinking alcohol and that's a healthier way to be. So I'll just do that. Whereas now I really encourage people not to drink all the time, not to be able to drink that. <laughs> Yeah, but like, you know, if you've got a really fun, like it's your best mate's wedding, like, and you want to have a few drinks, enjoy that. Know that the payoff is probably going to be the next day. You're going to be hungover. You're going to be probably heightened anxiety if that's mm. you. But um, but don't cut yourself off from the potential, uh, like fun of that social event and the connection that that does come from some alcohol. And, and at the end of the day, it's always going to be about flexibility and freedom. That's going to really set you free. It's not going to be hard and fast rules. So when it comes to food these days, I really encourage people to, you know, learn, learn the facts, learn about, okay, so dark leafy greens have a lot of magnesium and B vitamins. And with anxiety, we tend to use up a lot of those nutrients. So it's good to replenish my body with those a lot, um, ideally every day. But not stressing if you haven't done that today or, you know, making it an obsession. It's just like, you know, actually, I really enjoy, like, personally, I really enjoy adding spinach to a smoothie in the morning for breakfast. Yeah. Like, I don't taste it. I can't taste it. doesn't. And, and so everything I have in it, it tastes delicious. So it doesn't feel like um, I'm deprived in any way. And I think that's really important. Anyway, so yeah. that's kind of how I got out of that <laughs> obsessive food time. Um I think a few friends also kind of were concerned about me um, and brought that to my attention. And I didn't like it at the time. I thought they were like judging me and attacking me, but no, they were were coming from a good place and I'm grateful for those friends now. Um, But yeah, I, I, during that, so, so that's like, I guess I was just following that excitement into, into naturopathy and nutrition and um, ended up kind of uh, graduating from, from my four year degree and realized I practiced for two years as a, as a general naturopath treating everything. But I always, because anxiety was something that I'd experienced so intensely, 
And everyone else I studied with had their own condition. Like someone, you know, someone got into naturopathy because they had a, a thyroid condition or a hormone imbalance. But for me, I didn't have any of that. Yeah. And I always thought I didn't have a story. Like I thought I didn't wow. have a health condition. Then I was like, wait a second, anxiety. Yes. That's, that's my thing. So I um, had, had experience in those two years of this very busy clinic in Melbourne um, where I, I had, you know, saw lots and lots of patients um, and pretty much all of them had anxiety, but I was seeing everything as well. So people would come to me with, a weird skin rash or a um, thyroid condition, autoimmune or um, fertility issues. And for each of these things, you're expected to be the expert on all of those different conditions, but they are all so complex. Mm. And what I realized was I didn't always feel like I was the, the one with all the knowledge on the skin issue or all the knowledge on the fertility issue. So I didn't always feel as comfortable that I was the best person for that. But what I love now about what I do is I know so much about anxiety. I've had so much experience working with people in that specific thing. Mm. Um, but I have like, I love that. I don't get that icky feeling in my stomach anymore. When someone comes to me wanting my help, I know I'm the best person for yes. them to see. That That's such a brilliant, that's a, a, it's so lovely to hear and actually it's so good to hear about how the journey, because it sounds to me like um, that journey, um, you know, culminating in uh, finding a, a lane to give back was also the thing that also helped you with your own recovery. Yeah, totally. And I think finding a sense of purpose is a wonderful part of recovering from anxiety too. And I, I'm fortunate that I've found mine um, in helping people with anxiety. Mm. Um, but I believe everyone has a story and value to share. Um, you were just saying before, Tom, I think before um, we started this, that, that everyone should have a podcast because yeah. we, all, we all have something to offer. And, and I don't think everyone needs, who's had anxiety needs to be doing what I'm doing. But we all have our hidden gems and ways that we can offer value and you know, for the people who have been through perhaps greater traumas than you and I, um, I often say, say to them, this is a story you could share with someone one day that will help them feel understood in a way that no one else can. Mm. And you know, if there's ever, not that I think that we need to be finding a lesson in trauma or always, you know, finding a meaning in it or why did this happen? Sometimes stuff just happens, but I think it can be a beautiful way to use that experience um, and, and share that in a positive way with someone else. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think there's, there's so much truth in what you're saying and the, the greatest lesson that we've ever had to learn can be so powerful for someone else who's most likely at day one of learning that lesson and just, you know, cause I was looking at it, hearing your story is obviously very, very validating to my story because it's so innocuous, you know, but yeah. it's funny how we, we look at trauma and I think, you know, we're all, um, we're all learning more now with the internet and all that sort of thing. But um, we can look at that and be like, Oh, well, you know, it's not as though I went to war or I was sexually abused, like I said before, but even that is just shaming and then pathologizing even more and dividing the self even more. So hearing speak, people talk about their relativity of their pain is helpful for other people out there that are like, I don't deserve. It's almost like I don't deserve to be feeling anxiety right now, which is so insane, mm -hmm. especially when you're on the other side of it. Totally. And like, I think another example would be say a relationship breakup. Now mm -hmm. nearly all of us go through that experience of some people don't. Um, bless them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they can, they they can have their fun. <laughs> yeah, you go enjoy your perfect life. Yeah, no, yeah. They, they will have their own. They will have their own things to deal with anyway. We all do, don't we? But say a relationship breakup. It might have been an amicable breakup. It might have been a lovely relationship or a relationship where you just started going in different directions or there's no cheating and you and you think, why am I so hurt by this? Why did this break me? Um, but that's a perfectly normal response um for for someone who has lost a significant like attachment figure in their life a significant relationship um it feels like it feels like that person died 
you know, mm. in a lot of those, in a lot of those situations. And that is traumatic. And I think, um, you know, we all have, so we all have these innocuous sort of traumas and it could be easy to say, well, everyone goes through breakups, so I should be able to deal with this. Um, and you know, like minimize it and dismiss your, your experience. But you know, these can have a deep and lasting effect on us. And, and I think, um, it's important to at least allow people the space to, and, and give them permission to explore that and say, you know, this was a big thing that happened in your life and you're allowed mm. to ha- still be feeling it five years later or reacting in some way to it 10 years later, you know? For, uh, absolutely. Because I mean, th- I mean, that's part of the recovery process, isn't it? That, you know, just validating the story, um, you know, even having the words to explain the story gives us power over it. It's something that, okay, we're now starting to integrate. It happened in the past. It's no longer who we are anymore. We're not carrying the burden of shame and fear with us um, and all that sort of thing. 